Bill. Good morning, Gold Coast. You may hear my voice is a little different. I, like many of you, are under the weather right now. And the only reason I'm here right now is because I've mainlined some DayQuil. So that is propping me up. Drugs, yes, love it. I'll try not to. I, uh, I am so excited to be here this morning with you as we start our new series on the Gospel of John. Now, we made a study guide for you. And it was done last Tuesday, about noon. And since then, we have tried to get it to print. I have spent more hours trying to get it to print than I did creating the study guide. But the PDF is on our website. If you want to look at it, you can do that. It's there right on the opening page. There's a long kind of strip that says the study guide of John. And you can look at that, and we're hoping to somehow overcome our printing problems for next Sunday and have them for you. If anybody in here knows anything about printing, and I mean more than just pressing the button print, uh, I'd love to talk to you because it prints upside down, backwards, and all sorts of every which ways, and we're using an Adobe program called InDesign. So anyway, if anybody knows anything about that, come see me. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we had a worship night last Sunday, and it was the most amazing worship night I've ever seen. I just got an amen from Daryl. Wow. I'm, I'm telling you, it was incredible. And you don't want to miss the next one whenever we're going to do it, but it blew me away. So uh, just kudos to our worship team. They did an amazing uh, worship set last Sunday night, and I am blessed to have been part of that. It, it, was, uh, it drew me closer to the Lord. It was pretty cool. So uh, today to start off, I'd like to share some shocking stats. I got these from Scott. And um, these are... Uh, things that evangelicals believe. Now, who is an evangelical? Well, I've got the definition here for you. Evangelicals in this survey are defined as people who strongly agree with the four following statements. Statement one, the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. Statement two, it's very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Three, Jesus' death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. Four, only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. Nothing surprising there. So, what percent of evangelicals would say that Jesus isn't the only way to God? I'll take a, a guess. Go ahead. Shout it out. Okay, it's pretty close. 56% of evangelicals would say Jesus isn't the only way to God. Okay. What percentage of evangelicals would say Jesus is not God? Okay. What? 70? Okay, that's too high. 43%. Four out of 10. Last, last one for you. What percent of evangelicals would say Jesus was created by God? 73%. 73%. This, as a pastor, is shocking to me because these are things that are essential to being a Christian. You cannot be a Christian if you believe that Jesus was created. You cannot be a Christian if you don't believe Jesus is God. You cannot be a Christian if Jesus isn't the only way to God. So there's some kind of disconnect going on in America between pastors and their people. Maybe those people just aren't going to church. And so I bring this up because today we're going to open up and start our series on the Gospel of John. And John addresses this stuff right out of the chute, right up front in the very beginning. So what we're going to do is three things today. First, we're going to do an overview of the gospel. 
kind of look at who is John, where did he write this, what's he writing about, you know, like what's going on, why has he written this gospel, all this kind of stuff. Then I want to look at the word, what, what John calls Jesus, the word in the beginning. And then third, I want to look at the word and life. We're going to be in the Gospel of John, the first five verses, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, our ushers will make sure and get one in your hands. I would encourage you to actually have something you can write in and take notes on. Circle stuff, write stuff down. You know, the, uh, the fake Bible on your phone, you can't do that really. So that's a joke, by the way. I know it's a real Bible. But there's nothing like being able to put notes. If you could actually write notes easily, you know, circle and write stuff, I'd feel differently. But I encourage you to write in your Bibles. Let's read these verses first, and then we'll kind of look at this overview of John. So this is John 1, 1 through 5. It's the fourth gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And here's what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word for your words to us, for your word of Jesus. And we ask that right now, here in this place, that our our hearts and minds would explode in worship for you and awe for you and what you've done for us and how you communicate to us using this gospel of John. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be moving on us as a people to be more and more amazed at who you are. In your name we pray, amen. So why, why does John start his gospel this way, right? This, this whole, in the beginning was the word. So I think we need to understand who John is, first of all. He is the son of Zebedee. He's a fisherman. The scripture <clears throat> says that he's one of the sons of thunder, which I take to mean he probably had a pretty explosive personality. And five times in this gospel, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He had a very close relationship with Jesus, perhaps Jesus' best friend uh, on earth. Jesus and John were very close. John lays his head on Jesus in the Last Supper. And so he knows Jesus particularly well. And he probably wrote this gospel from the city of Ephesus, which we just got done studying Ephesians. John moves to Ephesus. He probably wrote from Ephesus and probably around 80 A.D., 50 years after the ascension of Jesus. There are some very unique things about John compared to the other Gospels. First of all, the other Gospels are what we would call synoptic Gospels, meaning they give a synopsis of the life of Jesus. But John doesn't do that. John kind of has a totally different approach. And the way I like to describe it and think about it is a synoptic Gospel, if you're watching football, is like a play-by-play commentator. Okay, he's telling you the action as it goes, right? You know, think about you're watching football on Sunday and he's like, you know, Brady drops back in the pocket, he throws it down, whatever. That's your play-by-play. That's a synoptic gospel. But then, in between the end of the play and the start of the next play, they have somebody called the color commentator who fills in while they're waiting for that next play to start. John is the color commentator of the gospels. He's not doing a play-by-play. He kind of drills down deep into individual encounters that Jesus has with people. So you get these long, extended looks at Jesus with the woman at the, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well. Long, extended look with Jesus and Nicodemus, with the man of authority, with Mary and Martha, with Lazarus, with Pilate, and others. He's drilling down where we get to see Jesus one-on-one with people. That's color, right? That's filling it in. It's not this broad brushstroke. It's a deep dive. Something else that's really interesting about John is that there's strong ties between John and the Old Testament. 1, 1 through 5 echoes Genesis 1, and 14 through 18, chapter 1, 14 through 18, echoes Genesis 33 through 40. And many people would say that John has 
kind of a simple style, but there's incredible theological depth. Some would even say that John is called a gospel of decision. When you read John, you are confronted with who Jesus is, and you must decide what you're going to do about him. And we see people over and over in the gospel get confronted with Jesus. And what are they going to do? Are they going to leave him? Will they follow him? Will they murder him? You get tons of different kinds of decisions. Something else that's interesting is that John uses what I would call time dilation. The first 12 chapters cover three years of Jesus' ministry. And the last eight chapters cover one week. So he pumps the brakes, and we do this deep, deep look into the last week of Jesus' life. You get the I am statements in John. You get this focus on dialogue. And so you've got to kind of be asking yourself, why did John then write this gospel? What's going on? I think that the other gospels had already been written, and he saw that there was a void. He said, you know, there's some things that need to be shared about Jesus that the synoptic gospels just aren't going deep enough. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he begins to write his gospel. Probably, I would guess, you know, he's doing teaching and preaching and probably drawing on some of that. The Holy Spirit is bringing things to his mind, and he writes this gospel to kind of share what he saw about Jesus. I also think it's really interesting. You start to see the rise of Gnosticism, which is this kind of uh, belief system that would say that, that flesh, right, is evil. And ultimately, it kind of concludes, the Gnostic thinkers would say that Jesus was never, never had a fleshly body. So John writes to, to counteract that and say, no, Jesus was flesh and blood. And John saw these gaps in the understanding of Jesus and was compelled through the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to write about Jesus' life. I think it's also really important to see John 20, 31 says this. He says, these things are written, this is the end of the book, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John wants you to believe in Jesus. That is why he is writing his gospel. He wants you to believe and he wants you to keep on believing. Don't get in your heads that this book is only for unbelievers. That is a huge error in thinking. If you're already a Christian to think, oh, well, I don't really need John. Believers in Jesus must go on believing in Jesus in order to be saved in the end. Jesus says in John 15, 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. And in John 8, 31, Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you are a believer in Jesus, you need to believe and keep on believing. And John can strengthen your conviction as you get to see who Jesus is and be amazed at what Jesus does and how he interacts with people and how he lives out the word of God day to day, the walking, breathing, talking word of God himself. As you see that as a believer, you're drawn in more and your faith is encouraged more. And you go, yes, this is the Savior of the world. And if you're not a believer, you read this for the first time, it can shake you up and draw you into his kingdom. I think also what we see here is that John, I think, probably had this thought process. It's just me guessing. But John came into his experience with Jesus expecting Jesus to be just the Jewish Messiah, an earthly man, maybe sent by God, but who would liberate his people. He did not come expecting Jesus to be God himself made flesh. Have you ever kind of found yourself stuck in a rut because you have thinking that's been kind of ground down into your mind your whole life, so it's hard to break free from that? Anybody ever been to a circus? I mean, do they even have circuses anymore? Okay. Okay. They, the circuses I've been to when I was a little kid, they'd have huge elephants there, right? And they've got a ring around their leg and a little tiny stake in the ground. And this is like a 10-ton elephant. Big tusks, big trunk, and he just stands there. Why does that elephant not just rip that thing out and go charging away? 
because they captured them when they were little. And they learned early on, I can't break the chain. So as an adult, they never try to. John had a thinking about Jesus that didn't get broken until Jesus raised from the dead and, and sees John, right? And John sees him, and then he goes, oh, you just shattered my worldview. So John is writing to us so that we don't get stuck in the same thinking. He wants us to not do what he did and be stuck for so many years. Three years he was stuck. It took John more than three years to figure out the fullness of who Jesus was. But he doesn't want us to take more than three verses to figure out what took him so long to know. He wants us to have our minds fixed and clear from the very beginning to understand the eternal majesty and the deity and the creator rights of Jesus Christ. So, let's look at our text. John 1, 1 through 5. Let's start to unpack that a little bit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's just stop right there for a second. So, first of all, I think the most important thing, before we even kind of get into this, is to understand that the Word became flesh. This Word that he's talking about here, if you drop down to verse 14, you'll see that it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the Word, and he became flesh. He was fully God and fully man. He had 100% a divine nature and 100% a human nature. So in the beginning is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. What do we mean by in the beginning? I think John is telling us before matter, before time, something existed. God himself existed before anything else. Jude mentions this in his doxology. He says, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now forever. Amen. Paul says in 2 Timothy that God gave us grace in Jesus Christ before the times of the ages. So before there was any time or any matter or anything else, you have the word existing before anything had been made. You tracking with me on that? This echoes Genesis 1, right? John's intentionally drawing a connection between his gospel here and Genesis 1. What's the first two words of Genesis? In the beginning. And then you get a creation story. So here we're in John, and you get this creation story. It says, in the beginning was the word. Why word? I mean, people have written a million books on this. I've got a few reasons for you why I think he calls Jesus the Word. First of all, I would think that Word has a special place in Hebrew thought. We have verses like this, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Samuel didn't know God was talking to him when God was calling him. The scripture says because he hadn't yet received the Word. That's kind of an interesting way to talk about this. Um, God's word goes out in Isaiah 55 and waters the earth and accomplishes what God desires. So there's this connection with Hebrew thought and the word, and there's also this connection in Greek thought with the word. In, in Greek, the word word is the word logos. Now, 900 or 1,000 years before the time of Jesus, the Greeks had all these philosophical schools of thought, and they were trying to figure out the reason for life, the purpose, the meaning of life. Wouldn't it be great if they had figured that out? I mean, aren't people still trying to figure that out? So they went around and around and they fought with each other a whole bunch. And they ultimately concluded, we can't figure out the meaning of life. And so then that kind of devolved, these philosophical schools devolved into kind of the Stoic philosophy and the... Um, the, Ep the Epicureans, the, the like, the ones who kind of were like, well, if there's no meaning, I'm just going to live my best life now. I'm just going to get what I can. I'm going to live it up, right? Or the Stoics who said, well, there's no meaning or life, so I'm going to make my own meaning through virtue and be a virtuous person. So this is kind of in the background of what John is writing about. And two, and John says, in the beginning is the meaning of life. You fought about the logos. You couldn't figure out what the meaning of life was 
And I'm telling you right now, the meaning of life is a person, Jesus Christ. That's pretty cool. I also think, though, that there's something else going on here. Why John uses the word word. And I think that is because Jesus is the ultimate message to us. He is the ultimate message. Ever since we fell in the garden, God has been trying to bring us back into relationship with himself. Think about all the ways he tried to do that. Set up a sacrificial system, right? But that didn't bring people back into right relationship with him. It was kind of a band-aid. At one point, he was so frustrated with people, he did Earth 2.0 and flooded the whole thing. Said, oh, I'm going to start over again. He picked a chosen people. He picked a chosen person in Abraham. He had, you know, David, and he had all the kingdom set up. He was constantly trying to bring people into relationship with himself, and nothing is working. Jesus is the ultimate message from God about how to be in relationship with him. John calls Jesus the word because he had come to see the words of Jesus as the truth of God and the person of Jesus as the truth of God in such a unified way that Jesus himself, in his coming, in his working, in his teaching, in his dying, and in his rising, is the final decisive message of God. He's the word. He's the ultimate truth. And when we say word, look at the next section. It says, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Let's just jump to the word was God part real quick. The word was God. He's not a lesser God. He's not a demigod. He's not an angel. He's not a creature. He's not something created. He's God. El Shaddai, Adonai, Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim. The names of Jesus from Revelation, which John also wrote. The firstborn from the dead, the highest of earthly kings, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God, the Almighty, the first and the last, the living one, the witness, the creator, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb, the shepherd, Christ, faithful and true, word of God, king of kings, Lord of lords. Jesus is God. And John makes that very clear. In the beginning was the Word. This is Jesus, and the Word was God. He's not created. He is God. How do you wrap your head around that? Because the other line that I skipped, it says the Word was with God. How can you be God and be with God at the same time? And much theology has been written about this. But this is the foundational doctrine here of the beginning of understanding the Trinity, that God eternally exists in three persons that share one divine essence. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. But all three, Father, Son, and Spirit, are God. That's the only way you can be with God something and be something otherwise you're a crazy person walking on the street right to be with and to be the thing he's with God and he is God in the beginning with God wow everything that is made is made through him and without him not anything was made that was made why does John phrase it this way? We have kind of this category of made things, right? John says there are things that have been made. And he says that the things that have been made, nothing was made that has been made that wasn't made through him. He's made everything. He wasn't made by God and then he created everything. He is God, and he created everything with the Father together and the Spirit. So how does this relate to us today? I think we can look real quick at the word and life. These are the next couple of verses here. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
There's life in the Word. The Word is life. This doesn't mean that the Word is alive, although he certainly was alive. What it means is that life is in the Word. He is the one that bestows life. He's the one that gives life. He has the agency to impart life. Life is his prerogative. Part of his nature is to give life, just as he breathed the breath of life into the dust and made man, life is in him. He made the first man. He can breathe life into your soul. He can make dead things alive. He's the only one since Adam who wasn't a dead man walking. He had no sin in him. There's no death in him that keeps him apart from God. He is the life. And he says, this life This is for people. It's the light of men. This life brings light into your life. When we behold the life, it becomes a light for us to make our way out of this dark world. Would you agree with me that the world is dark? Would you agree? We need light. And we have the light in Jesus Christ. As we take him into our life, we begin to shine light in our life and we can see clearly and hear God more clearly and move through this world of darkness not tripping because he's illuminating our path. The darkness of this world tried to extinguish this life light but was unable to. The enemy thought, I'll kill him on the cross and get rid of the light. And that didn't work out because Father raised him from the dead and in so doing conquered Satan's sin and death. And now that light is available for all who believe in his name. He went into the darkness and he rescued us and he gave us his life in exchange for our death so that we could live. So how do we get the power to see Jesus as the word, as the life, as the light of men? Until you don't just believe that he's the reason for life, but make him the reason for why you get up in the morning. Until you put him in the place he has to be. Until you give him the authority that he is due, he will never be the light of your life. You can't just acknowledge him as the light intellectually. Can, can we just get down to brass tacks here? If you know Jesus already, I'm going to ask you right now. Is he the reason you get up in the morning? Are you thinking about him? Are you dwelling on him? Are you bringing that word into your life to illuminate you? Because if you don't do that, you're missing out. You're missing the whole point. Until that happens, you're not going to have the life and the light that comes from people who are realizing their potential because they put him in their center. This is all about taking Jesus and plunging him into your heart, the deepest part of your life and heart, and saying, I want you to be my light. I need you to be my life. And as believers, for those of you that know Jesus already, it's easy to kind of drift away from that and not have him be at your center. Is he your logos? Is he the reason for you to exist? When you spend money, are you thinking, I'm doing this, whatever I'm buying or selling, because Jesus is my king? When you go to your work, are you thinking, Jesus is at my center, the word, the life, the light is there, and everything I do, how I interact with my coworkers, how I treat my time, how hard I work, I'm doing because he is my light. What about with your family? Do you let Jesus reign in how you deal with your family, how you love your wife, how you discipline your kids, what you do with your free time? Jesus has to be at the center. Make him your king and find out what you're built for. This is what we were designed for. 
to have the word in us. And if you don't know Jesus, and I'm not ever going to assume that just because I'm in a church, everybody knows Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I see what you're saying, and I wish I could believe it, but I don't. I really try to engage people in my life who are far from God. I see my role as a follower of Jesus as somebody that's out to make disciples. That's what Jesus is about. He says, go make disciples. This is my mantra. I try to make disciples and lead people to find Jesus. And I have a ton of people in my life who would would hear this message. They would say, oh, I wish I could believe that. It's fascinating to me, but I don't believe it. What do you do with that kind of person? The answer is to understand that every other religion on the face of the planet, Buddhism, Hinduism, Muslims, every other religion has a founder who is dead. But Christianity is the only religion that has a founder who is alive. And he's the one that can make you life. He doesn't just bring truth, he is the truth. He's the voice of truth. He is truth, he speaks his truth into the hardest, most rockiest of hearts, and he can make new life grow. He can inflame you with the beauty of his truth if you will go to Jesus and say, I must believe, I must explore this guy, I must figure out, I must study him. And I would encourage you over the next, I don't know how many weeks we're going to go, It could be a year or more, but I would encourage you as we do this dive into John that you would be asking the question, is the word in my heart? Is he my reason for being? You got to open yourself up and ask him to come on in. Be my word of truth, and he will hear that. Let me read this to you again one more time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray. Father, I think we can barely scratch the surface of what it means for you to be the word in our life. I think we just barely understand the idea of you being the reason and that we should center everything around you. And I ask that as we look at this gospel of John, that we would take you and plunge you in and seek you out every day and ask you to be the light in our life, to illuminate our path. And I trust that you will do that. In your name we pray, amen. We got communion. I got the elements over here and the side back there. I see them over there. I would encourage you this morning.